بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين على سيدنا وحبيبنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما وعملا يا رب العالمين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل عصدة من لساني يفقه قولي أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله الحمد لله it's nice to be back to Medina Masjid I think it's my third or fourth time visiting and it's nice to see you all again um, so I was asked to speak uh, about Muharram the month of Muharram maybe touch on some of the issues that we find in Muharram uh, with regards to Karbala uh, with regards to the 10th of Muharram, the day of Ashura, uh, and just to share some points on what happened, uh, what our stance is from the perspective of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, and so we are confident in what we believe. Um, and then, obviously, to open up if you have any questions and answers, inshallah. Um, so, firstly, the month of Muharram, it's the first month of the Islamic calendar, okay, of the Hijri calendar. Um, who can tell me what's the Hijri calendar based on? How did it come about? Does anybody know how it came about? It started from the Hijrah. Okay, it started from the Hijrah. So how did they decide that we're going to start from the Hijrah? Yes, yeah, so it was actually during the time that Umar radiallahu anhu was a Khalifa. Okay, Ibn Asakir and others, they report that one day Umar was presented with a contract. And on this contract it said, valid until Sha'ban. So Umar radiallahu anhu inquired, is this the Sha'ban that's passed or the Sha'ban that's to come? And because of this he said that the date should be included. So then the discussion arose, where, where, how do we determine dates? What do we start from? When do we start a year from? Etc. Etc. So then some of the companions said we should start our Islamic calendar from the advent of prophethood. From the time the Prophet ﷺ was given the message. Others said, no, we should start it from uh, the death of the Prophet ﷺ, the month and time in which he died, ﷺ. And then Umar radiallahu anhu said, no, we're going to start it from the Hijrah. Why? Because uh, the, it was the Hijrah in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala distinguished between the truth and falsehood. So all the companions agreed that we would use the Hijrah, that year of the Hijrah, as the year, the, the first year of the Islamic calendar. And they obviously agreed that Muharram would be the first month. Now Muharram is one of the four sacred months. <coughs> yes, one of the four sacred months. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he mentions in the Quran, إِنَّ عِدَّةَ الشُّهُورِ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ إِثْنَا عَشَرَ شَهْرًا That the months with Allah are twelve. فِي كِتَابِ اللَّهِ يُمَ خَلَقَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ مِنْهَا أَرْبَعَةٌ حُرُمٍ from these 12, there are four which are Hurum. Now, what does the word Hurum mean? We translate it as sacred or sanctified. Um, these are special months. Um, and as Ibn Abbas and others mentioned, that anything done in these months, for example, sins committed, any adham fi hinna a'zam, Ibn Abbas said, that the, the sin committed in these months, these four months, yes, is, is more, more greater in the Allah. It's uh, more severe with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They would cut off all war during these months. All, all sides would agree that there would be no war, no battles during these four months. Yes, yeah, so it's a month in which we should increase in our good deeds. We should watch our sins to make sure we're not disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And of course, this is a month of fasting. The whole month, by the way. Sometimes we get into this understanding that it's only these first ten days that are special and the rest is just normal. No, the whole month is a month of fasting. As the Prophet ﷺ, he said, أَفْضَلُ الصِّيَامِ بَعْدَ رَمَضَانِ شَهْرُ اللَّهِ muharram That the best of fasting after fasting the month of Ramadan is fasting في شهر الله, in the month of Allah, Muharram. And of course, as the ulama mentioned, the month of Allah, this is showing the great status of this month. Like Baytullah, the house of Allah, being the في مكة المكرمة. It shows the greatness, the, the virtue of these places when it's attached to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the same way, this month, Shahrullah, shows the great nature of this month. 
Uh, and of course, as you will have heard last week was the 10th, the day of Ashura, we were recommended and uh, encouraged to fast. And the reason we fast is what? It's not because this was the day of Ashura, the day when Hussein, Sayyidina Hussein was, was uh, martyred. Rather, we fast this day because this is the day that uh, when the Prophet ﷺ, he entered Medina, he found that the, the Jews were fasting. So he said, Mahada, what's this? Why are you fasting? And what was the reply? That this is a very righteous, a very blessed day. And they said that this, they went on to say that this was the day that Allah saved Musa السلام, from, and, and Bani Israel from um, Fir'aun and the, the, the enemies. Um, so Musa fasted it. Yeah, Musa. Um, and, uh, and different narrations it mentions, uh, Shukran Lillah, that he fasted it out of gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what was the reply of the Prophet والسلام, He said, أنا أحق بموسى منكم That I have more right to Musa than you. فصامه وأمر بسيامه So he fasted it and he commanded the companions to also fast this day. So that was, this is the reason we fast the, the day of Ashura. And then later on, uh, Ibn Abbas, he said to the Prophet والسلام, that the Jews are also fasting this day. And the Prophet والسلام, said, if I live to see next year, then I also fast. The ninth of Muharram to differentiate from the Jews. Um, so this is the reason why we fast the tenth of Muharram. And of course, in one hadith, the Prophet Ali sallallahu said, "Inni ahtasibu ala Allahi an yukafir sana lati qabla." That I have hope in Allah that fasting this one day, through it, Allah subhanahu wa taala will, will expiate, will forgive the sins of the previous year. And this is, you know, we should be very. Uh, you know, we should pay attention when we hear these kind of ahadith. When we're told that if you do such and such an action, your past sins will be forgiven. Why? Because these are ahadith in which the Prophet ﷺ is informing us of actions we can do, which will result in having our, our past uh, mistakes, minor mistakes and sins, forgiven. And these are purely through the mercy of Allah. He gives us this opportunity, a Jummah to a Jummah, the five daily salawat, Ramadan to Ramadan, all of these things, yes? Uh, will, will result in a person's minor sins being forgiven. Of course, the major sins, they require us to uh, do tawbah. <coughs> okay, so that's just a bit of background into the tenth, the day of Ashura, uh, the tenth of Muharram. Um, now, of course, there's a group of Muslims today, yes, namely the Shia, um, who believe that this is a day of sorrow. Okay, this is a day of grief, this is a day of sorrow, this is a day when you know, and, and just a month actually, they say that uh, this is a month when we should not show happiness, there should be no weddings, there should be, you heard this, yes? And this is actually even within, not just the Shia, Sahih, yeah, which I uh, found out uh, this year actually, I always thought it was just the Shia, I think. But actually within our community as well, people have this understanding that this month we should not be doing anything, okay? It's a month of sorrow, and I spoke to someone, they were saying you shouldn't even wear new clothes, you shouldn't do any of this. Why? Because of course we all, everybody accepts, you know, a great tragedy to, took place in Muharram, the, the, the murder of Sayyidina uh, Hussein, the grandson of the Prophet ﷺ, was a tragedy in our history. And it's, uh, of course, a sad occasion uh, when this took place. So they say that we should, of course, not do anything and it should be a month of, of sadness. And there should be no gatherings in this month and etc, etc. Um, and of course, from a Sunni perspective, you know, we see Sayyidina Hussein and as you know, the grandson of the Prophet والسلام, from Ahlul Bayt, beloved to us. You know, it goes without saying that you know, Ahlul Sunnah have uh, nothing but love for the family of the Prophet والسلام. And Ahlul Bayt, the family of the Prophet والسلام, they're not a normal family. They're a very special family. They have, we have higher, they have higher virtue than all other families. Uh, and have a special status. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about it in the Quran. That Allah wants to purify you from any filth and uh, cleanse you, a good cleansing. Um, there's a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, the very famous hadith of the cloak. When he got the cloak and he called for Fatima, his daughter, he called for Ali, he called for Hassan Hussein, he put them under the cloak. And he said, oh Allah, this is in Ahl that this is my, uh, the family, my family, this is, uh, you know, the family of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. These are my family. And even the, the companions, you know, they had great love for Ahlul Bayt. You find that Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he once said to Ali, 
And of course, Ali is from Ahlul Bayt. And what did he say to him? He said that I would rather be kind and generous to Ahlul Bayt than to my own family. This is Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. Subhanallah, some of the, the Shia you know, curse today. And of course, uh, Al Hassan Hussein, as the Prophet والسلام, mentioned, that Sayyida Shabab Ahlul Jannah, that they are the masters of the, the youth in Jannah. Yes, they are the leaders of the youth in Jannah. So Hussein radiallahu anhu was born. In the fourth year uh, after the Hijrah. Yes, the fourth year after the Hijrah. And of course, he grew up in the household of the Prophet, والسلام, those first five or six years. Um, he grew up in, uh, you know, around the Prophet. والسلام, he had great love for them from Allah. And you know, there's, there's narrations how they would play in the masjid and they would jump on the Prophet والسلام, when he was praying and all sorts. And this shows actually that the early children would come to the masjid. Yes, this wasn't a bad thing, by the way, that we have today where in some masjid the children aren't allowed. That they would come, they would play with him. In one narration, subhanAllah, mentions that the Prophet is was on the member. He's giving the khutbah, yeah, and Hassan walks in. And as a child, what do children do? They're falling over, he's doing this, causing a bit of a commotion. So what does the Prophet والسلام, do? He descends from the member, he goes, picks up Hassan, brings him towards the member and places him there. During the khutbah. That's sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So, you know, this was the, the, the grandchildren of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. Now, Hussein, he lived in Medina uh, until Ali became the Khalifa. Okay? Until Ali, and obviously Ali became the Khalifa after the martyrdom of Uthman. After Uthman was killed by the Khawarij. Um, Ali became the Khalifa. Now, Ali, he moved to, where did he move to? Iraq, yes, he moved to Kufa. And Ali, you know, he, he stayed in uh, Kufa. And of course, that's where he was also killed, again by the Khawarij. Um, so Hussein was there, he stayed there. After the death of Ali, he moved back to um, Medina. Uh, after the, the, the death of Ali, radiallahu anh, um, Hassan was given the bay'ah. Okay? So some of the people, they gave the bay'ah to Hassan. This was the, the Ahlul Kufa, the people of Iraq. They gave bay'ah to uh, Hassan radiallahu anhu. Whereas the people of Sham, of Syria, they gave bay'ah to who? Muawiyah, yes. Some water, please. Yeah, they gave uh, bay'ah to uh, Muawiyah radiallahu anhu. And of course, we all know what happened any at the time of Ali. And this is... We, about time to go into all that as well. But they were about to go to war. Okay? So that again, now they were about to go to war. And Hassan radiallahu anh, he said no, khalas. He gave up the uh, Khalifa ship in order to avoid further bloodshed. Because there had been the battle of the Jamal, battle of Sifin, these battles had taken place. So he didn't want any more bloodshed. So he gave it up and he said, khalas, Muawiyah can be the um, Khalifa to avoid, to avoid any more uh, bloodshed. So obviously Hassan was older than Hussein by about a year. Yeah? That's why he was given the, the, the bay'ah from the people of Iraq. Um, so uh, Hussein, he stayed in Medina okay, until uh, Muawiyah passed away. So Muawiyah is now, he's the Khalifa. Okay? And you know, he's reigning as the Khalifa for many years. And he passes away in the 60th year after the Hijrah. Now before he passed away, he did what? He said that his son Yazid is to be the Khalifa. And he said, after I go, Yazid is to be the Khalifa. Now some of the people, they said, fine, gave bay'ah, etc. No problem, the people of Sham and whatnot. But the people of Mecca, the people of Medina, they refused. Okay? So generally in Medina, it was Ahlul Bayt. So they, they refused. But there was no real massive issue. You know, at that time, it was just carried on, no problem. Um, but the rest of the people agreed that yes, Yazid is to become the uh, Khalifa. Um, so now Muawiyah passes away in the 60th year after the Hijrah. Yazid now becomes a Khalifa. The governor of Medina, he calls for Hussein. And what does he say to Hussein? And obviously at this time, there are still some major companions alive. Yes, Ibn Umar is alive, Ibn Abbas is alive, uh, uh, Abdullah bin Zubayr is alive. Uh, many, many are alive, some of the senior companions. Okay, and the, the governor calls for Hussein and he says, give the bay'ah. 
okay, give the bay'ah to Yazid. And Hussein radiallahu anhu, he refuses. He says, no, I'm not going to give the bay'ah. And then there's a bit of back and forth, back and forth. And he says, you know, I'm going to go and I'll come back or whatever. We'll see. So Hussein leaves. Yeah, and on that very night, he packs, he gets his family ready and says, we're going to go to Mecca. Okay, because in Mecca, there was Abdullah bin Zubair. Abdullah bin Zubair was also, not revolting, but he also didn't want to give bay'ah to uh, Bani Umayyah, yes, to Muawiyah. So, Hussein takes his family, they leave for Mecca. Yeah, they travel to, to Mecca and, you know, news spreads to the people of Kufa that Hussein has refused to give the bay'ah. So what now? So they say, look, they start writing letters. In some of the narrations of the books of uh, Tariq, it mentions hundreds of letters come to uh, Hussein when he reaches Mecca. That from the people of Iraq, from the people of Kufa, yes, they say, we're going to support you. We're going to be with you. Yeah, don't worry. You come to Kufa. We're going to, you know, be with you, etc., etc. And come, we're going to give you the bay'ah and all of this stuff. Just as they've done to Ali before. So, Hussein radiallahu anh, he's in Mecca. And he decides to do what? To send his cousin Mus, uh, Muslim ibn Akil. He sends his cousin uh, Muslim ibn Akil to Kufa. He says, go and find out what's going on. Is this really true? Are these people ready? Are they going to give me bay'ah? Uh, so Muslim ibn Akil, he goes to Kufa. And by himself or one or two with him. He reaches Kufa and he tells the people that, you know, uh, Hussein has sent me. What's going on? What's the situation? Are you people ready to give bay'ah? Okay, the people say, yes, we're going to give bay'ah, they come, and they give bay'ah to Muslim ibn Akil. Yes, the, the Pledge of Allegiance, that yes, we give allegiance to Hussein. And in some of the books it mentions, and Yasser Qadi mentions this, that actually, I couldn't find it, but he said 12,000 came and, uh, you know, gave bay'ah. 12,000 people from uh, Kufa, okay? And this are, these are all leaders and whatnot, so this is just them, so behind them there are many other thousands. Okay, we've also given the bay'ah, because these are the family leaders that are coming to give bay'ah, etc. So, you know, everybody in Kufa is buzzing, yes, Muslim Ibn Akil is here, Hussein is going to come, we're going to give the bay'ah, etc. So what does Muslim Ibn Akil do? He writes back to Hussein, who's in Mecca, and he says, yes, the people are ready, so many thousands have given the bay'ah, you come, straight away. So he sends this letter back, and obviously it takes time, and it's not like now you just make a phone call and subhanAllah it comes, and it takes many yeah, weeks. Um, to go back. Um, now all of this obviously, rumblings and what's going on and this news is spreading and uh, it reaches Yazid. Yazid is where? At this time he's in Sham. So what does Yazid do? He sends uh, one of his kind of lieutenants called Ibn Ziyad. And Ibn Ziyad was like a politician. So he says to Ibn Ziyad, you go to Kufa and sort this out. Yeah? Get rid of this governor, whoever this governor is, and you sort it out. Yeah? So Ibn Ziyad, he makes his way down towards Kufa. And he enters Kufa, yes, and he's got a turban wrapped around him. Okay, so he's got about 15, 20 people with him. That's it, small little group. And they make their way down uh, towards um, Kufa, and they enter Kufa, and the people start rejoicing. And they say, yes, who's come? Yes, they all think it's who? Hussein on the line. So they start rejoicing, yes, the grandson of the Prophet is here, we're here to give you bay'ah, etc. And then what does uh, Ibn Ziyad, he realizes that yes, this is true, that these people are conspiring. Yes, they want to uh, give bay'ah to Hussein. Um, so then he enters the, the, the fortress and he wants to find out, you know, who is this person that's come and, and stored this out, who is Hussein sent. He finds out that he sent somebody called Mus Muslim Ibn Akir, his cousin. So then he tries to now find Muslim Ibn Aqeel. Okay, he wants to get his hands on him. So, and he's a politician, a very smart man. So what does he do? He dresses one of these 15, 20 that came with him up as a traveller. And gave him a, a, you know, a lot of money. And said, you go now into the streets, yes, and pretend that you're a traveller from Sham. That you're from the, the, the Shia to Ali from Sham. Yes, from, you're from the followers of Ali who's come from Sham. And you've got this money and you want to give it to Muslim Ibn Aqeel. So he's going around, spends a few days in the different people's houses, whatnot, trying to say, yeah, I've come from Sham, I'm here to support um, uh, Hussein, etc. I want to meet Muslim Ibn Aqeel. And eventually, yeah, he gets uh, to, he finds out who's hosting uh, Muslim Ibn Aqeel. And the one who was hosting Muslim Ibn Aqeel was somebody called Hani Ibn Arwa. And he was like uh, a famous person in Kufa, seen as one of the community kind of leaders. 
and he's in Kufa now, and he's actually supporting Bani Umayya. So he's outwardly showing support for uh, Yazid and Bani Umayya. And behind the scenes, he's actually working with Hussein and yani, uh, Ahlul Bayt. So what does he do? So, you know, this, this traveler, he says, I've come, etc., etc. I want to meet Muslim Ibn Akil. He says, you can't meet him, what not. Yani, we've got to protect him and all these things. He said, I've got this money, etc., etc. In the end, yani, the, the, the man from Ibn Ziyad, he goes back to Ibn Ziyad in the fortress and he says, like, yes, we found out who it is who's actually uh, hosting Muslim Ibn Akil. So he calls for uh, Hani Ibn Arwa and he brings him to the fortress and he beats him up and he says, listen, now you're a traitor, blah, blah, etc., etc. Uh, and then the clan, the tribe of Hani come and they say, no, no, wait a minute, you can't be doing this to our one of our people, you know, you give him back or this or that, and you know, then they start to negotiate. And this was the way that things worked at that time. A lot of negotiation. So they negotiate. Okay, and they say, no, we're not going to harm him, but we want Muslim Ibn Aqeel. Yes? Muslim Ibn Aqeel, he finds out that, okay, right, this is what's going on. So he may, sends the message out to all the tribe and all the people that had given him bayah. And he said, we're going to march to the fortress now. Yes, we're going to go and take care of Ibn Ziyad. Yes, who Yazid had sent. So how many people did we say gave bayah in some of the narrations it mentions? 12,000. So he's thinking, that's 12,000, there must be many more thousands, of course, their families and whatnot. You're going to have a big crowd here. So what happens when the time comes? Only 4,000 turn up. He thinks, okay, it's still 4,000, and it's still a good number. And he will march. So they march towards, yes, the residence of Ibn Ziyad. Now Ibn Ziyad's clever, as we said, he was a politician. So he looks outside and he's observing what's going on and he sees you know, these 4,000 people and he looks and he, he's got, you know, obviously people from Kufa there with him who were already working in the, the, the Bani Umayyah uh, government and he said, who are these people? Who are these main people here? And they find and identify the main clans, the main tribes. And what does he do? Behind the scenes, Bakkan, he starts to negotiate with the leaders of these tribes. He says, look, we will give you this, we will give you that. You de basically, you know, uh, de facto, etc. Um, and, you know, we'll take care of you and all of this. So, slowly but surely, and this was in the morning, and he, and he mentions by Asr time, and he goes 4,000, uh, and he was deserted and left with about 70 people. Yeah, by Maghrib time. And after the Maghrib Salah, he prayed, and again, what is he doing in Ziyad? He's picking these people up one by one, tribe by tribe. He's taking them off. We'll give you this, we'll offer you that, etc., etc. And this was the nature of the people of Kufa, by the way. They did exactly the same with Ali. And Ali would always complain about the, the people of Kufa. Um, so he's left with what? After the Maghrib Salah, he turns around and there's 10 people left with him. And he thinks, we need to get out of here. And we came with 4,000, and now there's only 10 of us left. And he also he leaves. And he's going to go back to one of the houses of the people who's uh, giving him refuge. And as they're walking in the darkness of the night, even those 10 people leave. So he's left all by himself. And he thinks, subhanAllah, this is what the people of Kufa have done. Yes, they betrayed us again. So now he's walking around the streets, nowhere to go. Ibn Ziyad's forces are looking for him. He knocks on a door. Old lady opens the door. And um, he explains the situation. First he says, I just need this and that. And then he, he goes, I want to risk it. Yes? So he explains the situation. That I am Muslim Ibn Akil. That the people are looking for me. Give me refuge. Yes, I need to get out of here, give me refuge. So she says, okay, she agrees, she feels sorry for him. Um, the next day the son comes and he finds this guy here, what's going on here? So the mom says, look, this is Muslim Ibn Akil, we're going to look after him for the time being, don't tell anyone, this and that. The son says, okay, okay. What does the son do? Yeah, he goes straight, goes to the masjid, finds the lieutenant, he wants money at the end of the day. He says, he's in our house, send the forces. The forces come, they surround the house of this lady, and they, you know, call for Muslim Ibn Akil to come out. They eventually get hold of Muslim Ibn Akil, there's a little fight or skirmish. They get a hold of him, and they take him to Ibn Ziyad. Uh, Ibn Ziyad questions him, this and that, what's going on, and, you know, everything's come out. Yes, you guys are basically trying to revolt, you're not giving the bay'ah, uh, and whatnot. He tells him to give the bay'ah, he refuses, and then Ibn Ziyad, he throws him from the top of the building. He throws him from the top of the building. And this is, subhanAllah, the cousin of the Prophet, uh, of uh, Hussein radiallahu anhu, his cousin. Um, so he's now, subhanAllah, you know, died. And what, what was happening at this time? At this time, the letter had reached Mecca, 
and uh, Hussein is getting ready to leave. Because as far as he knows, the people of Kufa are waiting for him. That's the letter he received from uh, Muslim bin Aqil, that yes, the people of Kufa are waiting for you. So now he gets ready, he gets his family ready, about 100 people, and they're about to leave. And then the major companions, Ibn Umar, Ibn Abbas, you know, they all come and they say, no, and you can't leave. This is going to, it's going to be war, there's going to be, um, you know, battles, etc. Abu Sayyid al-Khudri, Jabir, Ibn Abdullah, many of them came and tried to, to, to warn Hussein, don't you remember what they did with your father? Don't go, you can't trust the people of Kufa. And even if you do go and they do support you, there's going to be war now with many Umayyah. So they're trying to convince him not to go. They're trying to say to him that, look, stay behind, don't do this, um, etc. And there's many narrations mentioned in Umar and what he said to, to Hussein, etc. But Hussein is very adamant that no, we're going to go. The people of Kufa are waiting. Look at all of these letters that we've received. They want me to come. Um, so he leaves and he makes his, his journey um, towards Kufa. And he reaches the outskirts of Kufa and he sends a messenger to, um, to, uh, to Kufa. Yes, to say that Hussein is here. So, of course, the people, the forces of Ibn Ziyad are waiting. So they're waiting, they find this messenger come, they kill him. So Hussein is looking that this messenger has not come back, he sends another one. They kill him as well. Okay, then Hussein realizes that, yes, the, the plot has been exposed. And some news reached him that, yes, Ibn Ziyad is here, the forces are here, they know what you've come to do. So now Hussein has a decision to make. He's now on the outskirts of, of Kufa and the discussion takes place. He's found out that actually Musa ibn Aqil has been killed, that the people of Kufa have not supported him, that they betrayed him. Now what do we do? Now the sons of Musa ibn Aqil were with Hussein, and they said, we're not going back. Yes, they've killed our father. Some of the other uh, young men were saying, no, we're not going to go. We're going to go and either we fight him in Ziyad and his forces, or at least we enter Kufa. When we enter Kufa and the people see you, Ya Hussein, yes, then, then of course they're going to follow you. Yeah, there's no way they're going to treat you like Muslim Ibn Aqil. They're not going to let any harm come to you. So the decision was made, okay, we're going to enter, um, we're going to enter uh, Kufa. So they make their way. And it, and it mentions it was the third of Muharram. And they reached Karbala, the plains of Karbala. And they're met by uh, the army, which was an army on another expedition. But Ibn Ziyad said, we're going to use them. They were on a, another expedition, but he used them, about 4,000 or so, to meet the, the, the group of around 100 or 150 or whatever it was, there was a few extra that came along the way uh, that were with Hussein. And now the dialogue starts. Okay, so the dialogue starts, what is going to happen? So this army, they say, and they see that this is the grandson of the Prophet so we didn't come here to fight you. We're not here on a different expedition. You know, so they don't want to get into a fight with Hussein. They don't want to you know, go down that road. Um, but also now they're being commanded by Ibn Ziyad. So what do they do? Um, so they start to negotiate. So Hussein, he realizes that there's no way now. The people of Kufa know about this. Nobody's coming out. Nobody's actually going to support me. So he says, um, you know, so now there's negotiation taking place. The letter's going back to Ibn Ziyad in his fortress. And then it comes back to, to the leader of the army in, uh, that is in Karbala. And they start to, to negotiate. Um, so, he, you know, Ibn Ziyad is very simple. He says straightforward that you have to, you have to give bay'ah. Yes, so he says to, sends a message to Hussein that you have to give bay'ah. Yeah, bay'ah to Yazid. So come give, give me bay'ah. Yeah, obviously on behalf of Yazid. So Hussein is saying that hey, we never gave you bay'ah to Yazid or to even Muawiyah. At the time, Muawiyah is a Khalifa. Do you think we're going to give any? Ibn Ziyad is like 25, 30 years old. Young lad. And he says, who's this obnoxious guy is telling me to come and give bay'ah? Hussein is no, there's no way. We never give it to Muawiyah, we never give it to Yazid, we're not going to come and give it to you. And he's, this is what you expect. He's not some, some coward who thinks, oh, I'm going to be killed now. No, this is uh, Hussein, not the Allah. So they begin to negotiate, and he says, okay, khalas, let me go then. I'll go back to Mecca. Ah, you know, the leader of the army says, alhamdulillah, at least it's sorted now, yeah? Obviously, we'll go back, we'll tell Ibn Ziyad, he, he's willing to go back to Mecca, end of story, yeah, and we get back to what we were doing. Ibn Ziyad, what does he turn around and say? He says, no, I don't care and if he thinks he's going to go back to Mecca. He's got two options. Yes, he either... And before this, what did uh, Hussein say? Hussein says, look, there are three things I can do. Let me go back to Mecca. Yes, number one. 
Yeah, if, look, nothing's going to happen now, the people have deserted me, let me go back to Makkah. Number two, take me directly to Yazid. Yes, don't take me to this Imanzi, yeah? take me directly to Yazid, in Sham. And I'll negotiate and speak to Yazid directly. Well, I don't need to speak to this guy for. That's number two. Or number three, Khalas, you don't want me to go back to Makkah because you think I might plot something, you don't want me to take me to Yazid, just send me an exile to a faraway land and I'll just worship Allah there. Khalas. End of story. So, the leader of this army, I can't remember his name, subhanAllah, he was the, the son of one of the companions. Um, regardless, anyway, so, again, like I said, he's happy, he thinks that, okay, one of these is very reasonable, Ibn Ziyad will choose one of these and, we, you know, we're sorted. Ibn Ibn Sa'd. Ibn? Ibn Sa'd. Ibn Sa'd. Ibn Sa'd. Ibn Sa'd. Yeah. Possibly. Yeah. Ibn Sa'd. Um, so he agrees that, yes, I'll take this message back. Inshallah, one of these three conditions will be met. And, you know, it's all done. And this, this one, Ziyad says, no, either bay'ah or war. Either bay'ah or war. So now the message comes back to the to Hussein that it's either bay'ah or war. He refuses. He says, we're not going to do bay'ah. Yeah, this was on the 9th of Muharram. And then on the 10th of Muharram, yes, uh, you know, uh, Ibn Ziyad, he sends uh, Shimr, who is one of his warriors, um, to Karbala. And then they, the battle took place. And it wasn't really a battle. I mean, they were one by one. The family of Hussein was coming out. The, the cousin, uh, the son of Ibn, uh, Ibn uh, Muslim Ibn Aqib were coming out. They were fighting. They were being killed. They were being killed. Until they came to Hussein. And he was fighting. But some of them, were, they didn't want to. Because even some of the the, uh, the the those in the army, they didn't want. They know this is the grandson of the Prophet. So somehow we're supposed to to hit him. And then it was Shimon and one or two others who came and actually dealt the final blows to uh, Hussein radiAllahu anhu. So that's in summary, very briefly. Of course, there's so much more detail to this. Yeah, there's so much debate and this happened and that happened, and you, you get all of these different sides of the story. But that's in a nutshell what we believe from the uh, the, the perspective of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. Now, as we said, so what do the, the, this group say? They say that this should be, uh, we should be regretful and remorseful over what happened. Okay, so as I said right at the beginning, no, no uh, celebrations, no ish, uh, occasions of joy, etc., etc., in this month. Um, and we, we are very simple in our response that actually, you know, from our Sharia, we do not believe, yes, that you, it's part of our Sharia to commemorate tragic events. Okay, of the past by holding gatherings on a yearly basis to show our regret and our sorrow. Yeah, this has never been the case. Okay, so we don't believe that actually on a yearly basis we renew sorrow, we renew regret that um, something has taken uh, place. Um, and of course, everybody accepts that it was a tragedy, that it was a dark chapter in our uh, Islamic tradition, that the grandson of the Prophet was murdered so brutally. Okay, but we believe also in the Qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that these people are being guaranteed and granted Jannah. Okay, and we do not every year come back and show displeasure with the Qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we simply ask them that why do you specify this one incident? Okay, there were so many other tragedies that took place. Why is it that not on those anniversaries we also have days of sorrow and regret, etc., or use that whole month? Uh, as a month of sorrow. Why don't we do the same in Dhul Hijjah? What happened in Dhul Hijjah? It was the month in which Uthman was martyred. Uthman an, is reading the Quran, he's reading the Mus'haf. And again, the Khawarij, they enter, and what do they do? They stab him, they kill him. And in the narration of his wife, it mentions that blood seeps onto the Mus'haf. And then they drag him out. They treated him like a dog. Astaghfirullah. This is yani, Uthman. And if this isn't a tragedy, I don't know what's a tragedy. This happened in, in the month of the Hijjah. When you look at um, uh, Ali radiallahu anhu, again, when was Ali radiallahu anhu killed by the Khawarij? This was in Ramadan. Yeah, some said the 17th of Ramadan. Yes, he's entering the masjid. As he's entering the masjid, one of the, uh, the Khawarij, uh, Ibn Muljam, he comes and he stabs him with poison. And Ali radiallahu anhu passes away. This has happened in the month of Ramadan. Are we going to say now in Ramadan you can't do anything? It's a, a month in which we have to show our sorrow, etc. Amir al Mu'minin, Umar radiallahu anhu. When Umar radiallahu anhu, he was also when he was stabbed leading the Fajr prayer. Yes, this was in the month of Dhul Hijjah. And he's leading the Fajr prayer, he's stabbed, uh, you know, the. and. Uh, what's his name? 
the one who's standing. Uh, Umar. Abu Lutlu. Abu Lutlu, he's the one who stabs him, the fire worshipper, and he's leaving and he's stabbing other people as well. And many other companions die. Yes, in the month of Dhul Hijjah, are we going to say now Dhul Hijjah, you can't do anything? Yes, simply, you know, in all honesty, what was the greatest tragedy to affect the Ummah? What was the greatest calamity to affect this Ummah was what? What's the death of the Prophet Ali Is there any greater tragedy? And that happened in the month of Rabi al Awal. Yes, we don't say in Rabi al Awal now you can't do anything, that no, this is a month of sadness, the Prophet says, and in, in the narration it mentions, as the Prophet said, that this is from the effects of the poison, yeah, from the Jewish lady. But we don't say now, Rabi al Awal, you can't do anything. So because this is not from our Sharia, this is not from our understanding of the religion that this is what we do on a yearly basis. I mean, the Prophet Ali Sallallahu in his own life, in he, and they say, Subhanallah, so I was speaking to one of them recently, and he said, look, that the Prophet Sallallahu when he cried and he foretold that uh, Hussein was going to be killed from people from his ummah. Yes, and this is a hadith. So look, he cried, just shows his sadness. So we should also be sad. He said to him, Subhanallah, did the Prophet Sallallahu not cry when his own son Ibrahim died? And he was burying his own son? Are we going to say now that we can't do anything there? Did the Prophet Sallallahu not cry when he's seen the Shuhada of Uhab, when he's seen Musa ibn Rumayr, when he's seen Hamza, Sayyid, yani the Asadullah, and he's seen the state of, of the companions, over 70 who had been killed? Did he not cry then? He cried. Yes, but never, not, when was the, the Battle of Uhud? In the fourth year after the Hijrah. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi not every year after that, he never held the commemorations or said that we have to be sad on this day. No, because again, as I said, this is not from our Sharia. Rather, what our Sharia teaches is what? Is that we learn from the le- lessons from the lives of these great individuals. We learn from the life of Hussein radiallahu anhu. We learn from the life of Umar radiallahu anhu. We learn from the life of Uthman and Ali and these great individuals of the past. Yes, we look at Uthman and we look at his devotion to the Quran. How he would read the whole Quran in one night. And that's what you learn from the life of Uthman. You learn bravery from the life of Hussein. You learn that Subhanallah from the life of Ali as a young man, somebody who stood firm on his knee. This is what you learn from their life. You learn justice from the life of Umar radiallahu anhu. And of course you learn so much, all of this and more from the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So this is what our religion, our deen teaches us when it comes to <coughs> commemorations of these events, etc. <coughs> that we don't hold these special gatherings and whatnot. And it is perfectly permissible to have a wedding in Muharram. Yes, as I said, many even within our own community think that no, it's not permissible. You can't have a wedding in Muharram. You can't do anything in Muharram. As we said, no. Just as this tragedy took place, so many other tragedies took place. Yes, sir. Ah, I just narrated to you five or six. And if you're going to say that, you have to say for every single one of them. Yes, and again, as I said, this was never done. Yes, from any of our, our salaf, from the Sahaba, from the Prophet ﷺ himself. He never did it after Uhud on a regular basis. So these are just some points I wanted to share. Like I said, the post had many things on there, Muharram, and Hussein, and, and this and that. So I, I don't know if I tried to summarize what happened at Karbala, tried to summarize the virtue of the month of Muharram, the day of Ashura, why we fast it, and what our stance is in terms of um, you know, uh, whether or not you commemorate it by, by you know, holding these gatherings of sadness and sorrow, etc. Um, so that's pretty much what I want to cover. If there's any questions, inshallah.